Okay, well, hey, uh, back again for a brief uh, lecture, I'm trying to cover some important points here on uh, session one for property 108. So this is uh, Rob Daywall. Give me my private email in case you need to get a hold of me and you can't reach me through any of the others. And this is uh, property. Session one. And uh, so basically what we have here is just kind of a straight lecture this time, not so much writing on the board. But I want to clue, clue you in on some important things that you're going to find uh, in your first chapter of property. Uh, and I think these uh, lectures are going to get more critical as we go through this. I think it would be very helpful for you in terms of some of your assignments and quizzes and things like that if you would view the lecture. The important thing too to remember is you can view this lecture six. I've had uh, times where students have told me they viewed my lecture 32 times just to be able to really understand the material. So that may be a little bit excessive for some of you, but uh, uh, at least made me feel like it was helping them to some extent. Well, one of the things we need to understand is that the American way of life, it goes way back into the English common law. A lot of the law of property is ancient, very old, and has not changed much over centuries. A lot of things that they were doing back in the 19th century, quite frankly, they're continuing to do today. Uh, some issues in that are that condominiums, for example, is a rather new idea. And so the law of condominiums and so forth uh, just kind of flies in the face of the overall understanding of, that we have about real estate. So it's uh, a little bit uh, uh, harder to say absolutely that everything in property is ancient. But for the most part, it is ancient. And there are a few exceptions like condominiums. Another thing I want to say to you is you know, that the whole basic concept of uh, the United States is a Bill of Rights, uh, uh, fundamental freedoms, the right to own property. Uh, and so these things are highly protected. Your home is your castle. Uh, and so uh, until recently, it's been almost an uh, inalienable right, uh, the right to own property. But um, some issues have arisen that we will talk about later on in the area of eminent domain and so forth that seem to fly in the face of our basic understanding of property. So generally speaking, uh, rule of thumb is that in the United States, ownership of real estate is kind of sacrosanct, or in other words, is very important. So uh, to say that uh, the law does not favor the free right to transfer ownership uh, and that the uh, law will approve any restraint on the owner's right to transfer ownership of property would be totally false. That it would be a mistake to say because in the United States, generally speaking, what we believe in is the alienability of property. In other words, that you can sell your property, that you can transfer it, that you can gift it to your kids. Uh, basically, you split it up, keep part of it, sell off part of it whatever you want to do. So the, the United States basic rule that's been adopted by most states is that people should have the free right to transfer their ownership and they will not approve uh, restraint on owner's right to transfer. Uh, the next thing we want to consider is that inheritance, so-called inheritance, part of wills, trusts, and estates, some of you may be taking it, at this time, it kind of goes hand in hand with property, as does bankruptcy, goes hand in hand with property. Uh, inheritance is the passage of real property uh, from one person uh, to another due to death. So in other words, grandpa dies, he gives his farm to his son. Uh, one of the issues that comes up in this a lot of times is uh, what we used to have in this country was a form of uh, primogenitor, primogenitor, and what that meant was the oldest son inherits the farm. And so this was very unkind to uh, people that had eight, nine kids. The oldest son gets 
uh, everything, and the eight kids, the eight other kids, get nothing. Uh, so basically, uh, kids were left to have to move on. And in the United States, it worked really well in the early days of this country because it forced the kids to move off to other places and buy cheap land somewhere. Uh, and uh, so it caused settlement to move west uh, in the United States. Uh, and a lot of it springs back to what we talk about when we talk about this primogenitor. But a lot of that's been changed today. We have a persterpes inheritance, meaning everything like this is shared among the kids. The problem with that is some of these really larger farms have been split up to smaller chunks and it can be kind of uh, unwieldy and not very useful in terms of farming. With this large scale uh, equipment that we have, these large combines and stuff like that, they're actually designed to uh, you know, work on thousands of acres of land and not on like 100 acres or 50 acres. And so it's kind of like the inheritance laws are working uh, at cross purposes with uh, good farming practices and the need for some pretty large tracts of land uh, for uh, our farming system as it is today to work. So some of these old laws, again, a little bit out of date. Uh, okay, so uh, another one that we want to talk about, fee simple absolute estate can have uh, infinite uh, duration and unrestricted uh, inheritability. And what that means is that uh, can move from one person in the family to another for centuries. Uh, that there's no way that the government can step in and take that away from a family. So you have some of these family farms that are hundreds of years old, been in the same family for hundreds of years. Uh, and so it's important to understand that, um, you know, we have that ability to fee simple uh, inheritance. Uh, occupancy of land uh, without permission of the owner is trespass, and, that, and that's true. In other words, someone comes on your land, whether it's posted or not, it's a form of trespass. Now the next part is, if you have the land posted, someone repeatedly is coming on your land after they've been warned, then you'd probably be protected if you would have to shoot these people, or at least shoot to wound them. So um, in Indiana, they really strongly recommend posting your property if you don't want anybody on it. I used to have a problem with hunters when I lived out in the country. They wanted to follow the creek, and the creek ran down uh, behind my property. Well, uh, half that creek was mine, belonged to me. Uh, and so the land on the shore of the creek belonged to me. And yet these people were walking along back there with shotguns and stuff. And it, it really uh, was upsetting to me because I, it was, you know, a couple acres away. But still I had a bad feeling that if they were carrying a rifle uh, or a shotgun or something, they fired it toward my house, they could have hurt one of my kids or busted out my windows and so forth. So. Uh, this can actually come up uh, to all of us on a daily basis. This is a real problem. So trespassing is any unwanted or unlawful entry on another person's real estate. It's almost like there's an invisible wall around your real estate. It's called the close, C-L-O-S-E. And if anybody steps inside that close, it's like they've stepped inside a door without their permission. Now, to go in your house is even worse. That becomes a more serious crime. In Indiana, that would be what we call residential entry. But you notice already how we're running across from criminal law to estate law to bankruptcy law, all these different things that we've mentioned that touch on property. So an uh, important thing is also to remember that fixtures are classified as uh, real property. Now, what's an example of a fixture? Well, how about a water heater? You know, water heater is uh, plumbed into the house. It's attached to the water pipes. Uh, the water pipes are attached to the house. They come up through the ground. Uh, the water pipes, the water heater, the bathtub, uh, all this is a fixture. These are fixtures that stay with the house when the house is sold. Now, what about the TV? Well, uh, this can kind of get a little bit borderline because a lot of people now are attaching their television to the wall. Uh, and if you've got to tear a big hole in the wall in order to get that TV down to take it with you, 
then that can be problematic for someone. But generally speaking, something like a TV is not traditionally considered to be a fixture, nor is the water uh, basically uh, washer and dryer is what I was trying to say, and uh, the refrigerator. Appliances like that generally come and go, uh, not fixtures. Water heater, water softener, uh, these type of appliances stay because they are affixed to the pipes. If you notice on your uh, washing machine, it's got a hose on there. You can easily unhook that hose, unplug it from the wall, stick it on a truck, and off you go. So uh, any kind of a fixture is classified as real property. That real property can include you know, a number of different things. Uh, a, um, a water heater, you know, items like that. Now, I've had cases, I've actually seen cases where people were so mad because the bank foreclosed on their house and they literally came in, took the front door, the garage doors, the water heater, the furnace, I mean, all these things are fixtures. You cannot take the windows, the walls, you know, you can't take anything out of that house that is what we say affixed. You know, the, you know, the drywall, the windows, the doors, all these things are affixed to the house. They're part of the real estate. They are fixtures. Well, okay. Um, Life estates is something else. It's a, it goes into estate planning again, but a life estate is when a person reserves the right to live in their house for their life. Excuse me. So basically a life estate is uh, grandma wants to live in her house and then when she dies she wants it to go to Ivy Tech as a donation. Okay, that could be a way that you could do some estate planning, uh, especially if the kids don't want it, nobody else wants to live on the farm, uh, and that could be used as maybe a new campus or something. Uh, so life estates, uh, you know, basically they are transferable during the life of the person. The idea though generally is that the, you reserve a life estate in real estate in order that you can live there for the rest of your life. Uh, basically personal property you know we aren't talking very much about personal property but in chapter one we touch on it remember that I talked a little bit about bailments on personal property it's kind of a specialized part of that personal uh, property section personal property can include living things like animals uh, like, like I've seen a lot of divorces where people fought over the dog just like a child it's almost like a child custody case but it's really not it's just ownership of property. And I know a lot of people don't want to accept that. I know myself, I love my dog and I've loved all my dogs and I don't want to see any of them go to anybody. So, uh, you know, it's one of those things that you do start thinking about your, your dog as a kid, but it's really not. And this is really true of um, cattle, uh, horses, you know, all these kind of items. This, this is personal property. Uh, Another area that you get into, especially like in law school and personal property, is wild animals. If you domesticate uh, wild animals, like uh, some of these feral cats, or uh, some people will even uh, get a wolf, you know, and uh, domesticate that wolf to be their uh, own pet, uh, you know, those kind of animals uh, can be considered personal property. Uh, now, um, Inheritance uh, is not necessarily transfer of ownership of real property when a person dies with a will. Inheritance is really transfer of property by any means. Uh, you don't have to have a will, you can do it by any means. So it would be false to say that inheritance is transfer of ownership of real property when a person dies with a will. That would be an unfair statement because it's uh, too narrow. There's a lot broader uh, line of thought on inheritance of uh, real estate. Uh, basically, adverse possession is another thing that's touched on in uh, section one, uh, session one. Basically, what it's saying is that, uh, you know, adverse possession, you want to work, work on this word, it's called ocean. Uh, it has to be uh, open, uh, you know, held in common, in other words, nobody can see, uh, uh, 
you coming and going, that you're there all the time. In other words, you can't go there and live for a year and then come back. It needs to be obvious, um, and then it needs to be continuous. So in other words, continuous, you have to stay there for the time period, depending on what state you're in. Some states it's 21 years, other states uh, can be a lesser term, like 12 years. Uh, and then, um, you know, you have to be um, making improvements, things like that. Big thing in Indiana, though, that's come up on adverse possession is the requirement that you uh, pay the taxes. This comes up in a lot of cases in Indiana, and you're going to look at that. Now, for those of you that view these uh, videos pretty faithfully, here's a little extra credit assignment for you. I want you to investigate these cases and report on a case, brief it for me, uh, on this issue of uh, adverse possession, uh, paying the taxes. Do you have to pay the property taxes on the real estate in order to assert adverse possession in real estate in Indiana? This is not true in a lot of states, especially western states, but I know there are some cases on this in Indiana. So for extra credit, it'd be 25 points. If you would investigate, brief a case, and email it to me, I will give you credit for the uh, issue about adverse possession, how it's defined in Indiana. Uh, and so try to look into that, work on it, come up with something on that. But it's very important to understand that there are all these elements to uh, adverse possession and uh, the acronym OCEAN covers a lot of these things. And so uh, the true owner might live in Philadelphia or somewhere, Albany, New York or whatever whereas the adverse possessor has uh, been living on the land, making improvements, uh, staying there continuously, not coming and going. Uh, you know, they can't live there one year, be gone a year, come back a year. It's got to be constant and continuous. You cannot have interruptions in that time period. Uh, another thing is uh, water. Water is very important. It's often called the riparian rights to water, riparian, it'd be like R-A-P-A-R-I-A-N, I believe, riparian. And so basically what it's saying is that uh, basically water is available to people that are on both sides of the creek and upstream and downstream. And so uh, the landowners along the shore of water, the first landowner who uh, uses the water, like at the headwaters of a stream, uh, they could be called, uh, they could be allowed what's called appropriation, which in other words means that they can uh, avert that water, they can use that water as they see fit, they can water their cattle, they can drink the water, they can use it for any purpose that they see fit. Now one of the problems that we're getting into is a lot of water that comes out of Colorado in the mountains, you know, the snow falls, then it melts, then it goes down the side of the mountain, and it ends up in Los Angeles, of all places, by going down the Colorado River. Well, the problem that you're getting is, uh, because of the Sierra Madre Mountains and a number of things, was, but the biggest thing is the consumption by the people in Los Angeles, uh, that water is not going back, uh, and so they've been kind of suffering a drought in Colorado. So there's a lot of issues with, uh, how water usage is being handled, and this is another area of property that is somewhat controversial. So the issues have more to do with sharing the water more so than the person at the top or headwaters of a stream having the right to appropriate all the water. Uh, so this is another common area of uh, issues that we see. Another thing we want to talk about is uh, laws that govern the law of real property uh, is uh, usually the law of the state where the real property is located. I know a lot of you in your discussion board have already posted this and that's kind of why I hesitate a little bit to put this discussion up. But basically it's the law of the state where the real property is located controls uh, any kind of controversy regarding real property. So two parties, I think Connecticut, Georgia, and they have this uh, vacation home down in Florida, well, uh, the law of real property of Florida would be controlling in that case. 
Uh, basically, a uh, typical period a person must possess real estate in order to be uh, the adverse possessor. Like I said, this varies from state to state. Uh, it can be anywhere from 7 to 20 years, 7 to 20 years. So in that 21st year, you're the owner in some states. But then there are other rules that apply also. Like I said, this rule that I think you need to investigate, which is that whole issue about the um, laws of the state that you're in. So in other words, one of the things I was talking about is the taxation part, but there are also other things that you want to consider regarding adverse possession in Indiana. Like I say, some states have reduced this down all the way to seven years. So if they live continuously on this land and achieve all the other aspects of ocean and the, the time period is only seven years so that's really uh, modern thinking uh, that you know if someone is going to uh, really care about their land they need to do something uh, with regard to their land within seven years otherwise they basically abandon the property as the thinking well here's a uh, fact scenario uh, that you want to consider and this might be something else too that you might want to send me your answer by way of email for this uh, uh, extra credit and that is uh, let's say that Henry transfers property to Susan for the life of Tom and then on to Kevin and on the death of Susan the property owner is so in other words the ownership uh, is to Susan but the uh, time period is the life of Tom so let us say that Susan is like 30 years old, but Tom is 8 years old. And then if uh, Tom dies, uh, then it goes to Kevin, okay? So basically, uh, so let's say Tom gets hit by riding his bike at the age of 10. Well, it's no longer Susan then, it's Kevin's, okay? It's never Tom's, but if uh, something happens to Susan and Tom is still alive, then it still belongs to Susan, okay? So, you know, those are things you gotta consider is the measuring stick is the life of Tom. Let's say that he is uh, really uh, young and he lives a long, long time and Susan is somewhat older, then uh, basically uh, at some point in her life it'll transfer to Kevin when she passes away. But if Tom is really old, older than Susan, then chances are uh, you know, there's a better possibility that Susan will transfer it to Kevin, if you understand what I'm saying. But all this time, uh, if uh, Susan passes away, then the property still belongs to her family or her heirs. Kind of confusing. It's kind of a trick question. Uh, take a shot at it. Uh, let me know what you think. Uh, also, here's another one. Good old Susan, she gets around. Henry transfers a life estate to Susan. So you got plenty of uh, chances here. So Susan gets to live in this property as long as she lives. But the remainder man in that case is Tom. So basically gets, Tom gets the property uh, after Susan dies. So basically, Tom dies before Susan. Okay, so then Susan lives out her life and then Susan dies. So who does the property belong to? Well, the answer to this one is Tom's heirs. Tom's heirs because still goes to Tom's estate after Susan dies, even though Tom died first. But that's the way this is set up. Uh, Susan only has a life estate in the property, not full ownership of the property. That's the difference between the first scenario and the second. Well, anytime there is real estate that is conveyed in a will, it is referred to as a device, and that is spelled D-E-V-I-S-E. -E. Okay, Aaron conveys to Bill an estate of property for 20 years, and upon the expiration of 20 years, then it goes to Carol. Carol's estate in the property would be a remainder estate in fee simple. So in other words, she has to wait around for 20 years, and then she gets the property. Once again, if any time Bill dies, then it would still belong to Bill's family until the 20 years has run. But if it's 21 years, it now belongs to Carol. Now, if Carol dies first, then still Carol's heirs would inherit the property, 
when Bill dies, or in other words, assuming that's 20 years. Now, adding together periods of adverse possession is called tacking. And what happens there, say someone uh, possesses this property for five years and then they quit claim their interest, whatever it is, to an, a buyer. They sell off their interest in the property to a buyer, okay? Even though they're actually squatting on this land, okay? Well, the new buyer, they stay on the property for 10 years, okay? And uh, so then they in turn sell it to somebody else. And this goes on until 20 years. And you know, the statute for adverse possession is 20 years. Well, in that case, using tacking, the new person has continuously uh, lived on the property for over 20 years because they get the benefit of what they bought in the bargain with the first and second buyer, if you see what I'm saying. Very confusing, but that is another thing. Now here again, if the time period is only seven years, then you've got to compress it down. But the traditional time period for adverse possession is 20 years. Okay, main methods of acquiring ownership to real estate. Uh, you know, this can be by a warranty deed, a quit claim deed, but this is a lesser type of ownership. Your, a quit claim deed means you're taking a property with all of its faults. If somebody else owns it, that quit claim deed isn't doing you much good. A warranty deed, on the other hand, is the giving of the property uh, with warranties, meaning I guarantee that I own this property. That's the warranty. In the quit claim deed, there's no warranty of ownership. It's just whatever interest that I may have. Well, you may not have an interest, but you think you do. Well, uh, okay, that's the difference. Now, if you don't have an interest and you give somebody a quit claim deed, then it's some kind of fraud. Okay, again on adverse possession, uh, under color of title, most states consider uh, instruments as evidence of color of title. Well, once again, we can get into a lot of different uh, types of documents, but primarily uh, we're looking at quit claim deeds, warranty deeds, you can have a tax deed, you can have uh, an order uh, through foreclosure, you can have an order uh, through a court. Uh, of inheritance, uh, there's just a lot of different ways that you can establish uh, color of title. Um, determining whether or not an item is a fixture, this is coming up again. Fixtures, again, have to be attached to the land. Okay, so if they're incorporated in such a way that it would be almost impossible to remove them from the property uh, without damaging the property, uh, then you basically have a fixture. Now one thing to understand is that like business fixtures, like let's say a pizza parlor, and you've got a great big pizza oven in there that's attached, well let's say that you sell the ground but you say I'm not selling you the pizza oven, I'm taking that with me to my new store. Well, uh, that, that can be done in a commercial setting as uh, residential real estate is the one where fixtures have to stay with the land. So well pump, uh, you know, water heater, most of the things about water, uh, electric boxes that are attached, all the wiring in the house, uh, you can't go off and pull all your wiring out of your house, you know. Uh, anything that damages the house, makes it non-functional, means that um, you cannot remove it, it is a fixture. Uh, basically, uh, well, when we talk about a fee simple and land, we're talking about clear ownership with no conditions, okay? But another type of ownership is fee simple determinable, and what fee simple determinable is, is that there are conditions. So, uh, example given in your uh, materials is uh, the property is owned by the owner as long as he uses it for farming. Okay, well, let's say that you want to turn around and sell it to somebody to build an apartment complex on. You cannot do it. If you sell it to a, someone for an apartment complex, then there's going to be someone else out there that's going to get that back, like the heirs of the person that gave it to you, conditional on farming. 
another thing is a failure of an owner in a life estate to maintain real estate. I've seen this a lot of times. If someone lets the whole place go to seed, they don't trim the trees, they don't mow the lawn, the roof's leaking. So in other words, the house is actually falling apart uh, and it's just unkempt, there's junk everywhere, there's old cars and stuff, then that is called waste, W-A-S-T-E, waste. So if you don't take good care of your property and you have it just as a life estate, you're going to lose it and it'll go back to the original owner. Uh, or it may be that uh, the way it's written in some kind of will or something that it can be uh, passed on to the remainder man that would receive it after you're gone. Uh, there are a number of things that are uh, personal property. Uh, these include fixtures, but the thing you need to understand is that still does not mean that it can be removed from the real estate. Now, if it is commercial fixture, it can be removed from the real estate. Like I said, a pizza oven, but if it's a water heater, chances are no, it can't be removed. So, um, acts of possession, uh, again, look up the word, the, uh, the, uh, the um, concept of ocean, O-C-E-A-N, ocean. So you've got to answer all those of occupying real estate, act, acts of possession, uh, and adverse possession. Uh, what we use for that is ocean. So you can fill in the blanks on that. Let me know if you have any questions or problems. Well, basically that is the session one kind of review that I wanted to give you so that you'll be uh, understanding this material for your assignments. Uh, feel free to get a hold of me if you have any concerns or questions. Uh, and uh, you need to do a little bit of your own legwork. So let me know that you did watch this by sending me uh, your uh, extra credit assignments. We'll give you a little few points for actually uh, paying attention in class. Uh, thanks a lot. Hope this helps. We'll see you next time around.